Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this Friday session that is going to be an absolutely wonderful conversation with some brilliant black women. My name is Necka McGregor, and I'm going to be the moderator today. I want to start off by acknowledging that I'm coming to you this morning, this beautiful Friday morning, on Indigenous land in Toronto that belongs to the Indigenous peoples, the Haudenosaunee, the Huron-Wendat, the Mississaugas. And in honour and respect for Indigenous people and their land, I do my work as an ally, as an accomplice, and constantly in solidarity for the rights and humanity of Indigenous peoples. Today's session is going to be uh, um, a discussion around traumatic brain, brain injury at the intersection of race and gender, understanding the experiences of Black women survivors of traumatic brain injury at, in accessing medical support. We're going to have a very full and authentic free-flowing conversation about the impact of systemic racism and how it significantly impaired these panelists' ability to be seen, to be believed, and to be treated by TBI professionals and the overwhelming majority who denied them treatment. Um, I think it's important to also look at the implicit biases that impacted the perceptions that plagued individuals about black women and how, because of these perceptions, our panelists were denied access to treatment. We're going to un unpack how differential outcomes for these black women survivors, um, whose experiences mirrors so many of other black women across North America. So I'm going to welcome you all, welcome the panelists. I am so excited. I am so, so excited and so honored to be in the presence of some beautiful, brilliant, bold, audacious black women. I'm going to introduce them alphabetically. We have Deneen Brooks, we have Devine Mason, we have Courtney Walker and Erica Renee Walker, and I did it alphabetically. So, my sisters, welcome. How are you feeling? You're all amazing. Yes. <laughs> there we go, there we go. So my first question, is really, I'm, I'm gonna go around to everybody, but we're going to do it alphabetically. I'd like you to share a little bit about your journey with traumatic brain injury and how long it took before you received the diagnosis um, from the, the medical profession, starting with Deneen. A little bit about your journey. So, um, my journey was a long, long ride, honestly. It started with a car ride to come to work that morning. Uh, I remember it was a beautiful morning in October. The sun was shining. I was ready and excited to come to my campus to work with my students. And I was at the light right before entering campus and I was hit from behind. And um, the only th thing I remember about that car accident was I heard confusion being hit, hit my head. And I remember being put on an ambulance and going to the hospital. Um, I felt dazed, confused about what happened. I had never had a concussion, so I never, I, I didn't know what was happening. So I was out of it for a little bit of time. And by the time I came through and um, got to the hospital and they did an MRI and took care of me there, um, and said to follow up with my doctor in a week. And during that week, I should just go home and rest. When I went back to my doctor in a week, I was still having severe concussion headaches that radiated. Um, and I kept going back to the doctor's office uh, every for follow up, you know, with time that he recommended. And long story short, it took me telling my doctor time after time, all the symptoms I was having in terms of um, ringing in my ears, blurred vision, to the point where it looked like a microscope. The, the vision was that bad. Um, I couldn't concentrate, I couldn't focus. I was actually going through the tenure process and I wasn't able to teach class in the way I did before injury. Um, and function in a classroom and engage with my students, it became more difficult to the point where I got vertigo and I ended up in the hospital a number of times um, and taken by ambulance. So 
with these vertigo episodes and being in the hospital, the only thing they did for treatment was really just to hydrate me and send me home and tell me to follow my doctor. That went on for five years. And that's a little bit about the process of being diagnosed was feeling like I wasn't being heard or listened to, um, having my symptoms dismissed in that process and also feeling very isolated because I wasn't getting connected to resources. Wow, wow, five years, five years. Devine, my lovely, how, how are you? I'm here. Same question. Same question, share a little bit about your journey and how long it took sure. before you got the, the diagnosis. Well, the reason why I'm even here is because um, I got mines behind a domestic violence incident where I was hit over the head and knocked unconscious. And um, shortly after that, I began having seizures behind this. And of course, taken to a neurologist to be put on medication. And I, to, I believe I was put on some kind of cocktails because I just kept having these seizures. I've never, ever had them before um, in my life. At this point in time, I was 27. So up to 27 years um, with three children at this time, I've never, ever, ever had one seizure. Headaches, when I say headaches, they, these weren't normal headaches. I'm talking about every single day to the point where they were like blinding. No type of medication that I could take was getting rid of these doggone headaches. Um, so keep going to the doctor. The medications that they were giving me weren't even controlling these seizures. At one point in time, I was having five to six seizures a day. Imagine um, constantly going to the hospital having these amount of seizures. And at one point in time, I was taking literally 16 pills a day and they were not controlling these seizures. And it was like, I would go to the emergency room. All they were doing was putting an IV in me, giving me um, something to keep me hydrated, and then sending me back home. I was doing MRI after MRI, test after test, CAT scan after CAT scan, but they were still just sending me home. And then I felt so shunned because how did you, how did this happen? Oh, domestic violence. And I think it just stopped at that. Like, oh, that's how it happened. I kind of felt like I was looked down on. Once they found that out, it was just like, oh, okay. And especially going to the emergency room because I was left there so many times, it bring in, being brought in on that stretcher and then just left on the side of that wall. Or sometimes when I was able to walk in, I would just sit there in that waiting room, waiting for a nurse to even, even when I got to the nurse's station, waiting for her to come and do my, I'm like, oh my God, I just had a seizure. I'm so out of it especially after having a seizure, you're literally out of it. Mm -hmm. I'm just like, oh my God, would somebody come? M my frustration is rising. Would somebody come and see about me? They're taking their time. And by the time they get over to you, they're so callous. I'm just like, really? This is just not what I expect from a medical professional. I mean, just like, it was so frustrating. And then I have children who are actually picking me up because I have grandma seizures. So I have children that are actually literally picking me up off of the floor, wow. putting me back in the bed. I'm losing continence. They're wiping me up. They're seeing me yelling and screaming and doing all of these kind of things. At one point in time, they just bothered. They just stopped calling, you know, the ambulance because they're doing the same thing over and over. So they gave up on that. I wasn't getting any help. No. And you were saying that you think it was also complicated because of the domestic violence. Uh, oh, most episode. definitely. Why are you even asking me that question? What, what should that matter? Once yeah. you found out and that you, why didn't you leave? What do you mean, why didn't I leave? Yeah. How well, about ask me, how am I doing? Yeah, yeah. We're going to explore that a little further, but thank you so much for, that's intense. That is really intense. Courtney, hey, how are you? Are you on mute? Yes, I was. I just unmuted myself. There we go. Hi, Nessa. Hi. So share a little bit about your story, your journey. So my um, TBI journey has been for the past seven years. It's now going on seven years of my healing and this journey with TBI. Um, how I su even sustained a concussion. I was in 2014, February 2014. I was a senior in college, 24 years old, getting ready to um, prepare for my uh, 
senior project to possibly go to New York City, audition in front of all of these my class, my senior class, and um, I was going to do acting. Um, I was also a dancer, pre-athlete as well, very athletic, and um, just about to start my life. And I was at home, and um, I was trying to look for something. I can't remember what I was looking what I was looking for before I left the house. And whatever I was looking for, I was like crouched underneath like our island marble countertop table. And I was on the phone too, trying to find whatever, trying to get out the house at a reasonable time. And by doing all this stuff, I didn't clear it. And I would normally just move out the way and just get up and go. But this time I just came up, hit my head right here. And I just remember blacking out what felt like a split second to me, but my vision went black at that point. And um, I was on the phone with my grandmother, who is a retired nurse. She said, what happened? I was like, oh, my gosh, I hit my head. I'll call you back. I remember just holding my head, and I had the most excruciating pain I could ever imagine. My vision came to my sister, who was at the house. Um, she saw what happened. I said, give me ice, give me ice. And I immediately, um, my vision came to, and I went to the restroom, was looking in my hair to see if there was any bleeding or a cut. Nothing was there on my head for five minutes. And the headache subsided and uh, we went on about our day. And my grandmother, um, who I met later on that evening at church, um, I was sitting with her and she noticed that I looked a little funny. And she said, are you OK? Like that. I was like, you know, I said, I, you know, I, I'm hungry or something. But my vision at this point was going in and out, in and out. It was really hard for me to focus. And then all of a sudden I just started getting a massive headache again. And so me and my sister um, and my grandmother, we left after church and she said, when you get home, call me. I said, okay, went home from work. She said, hi, Courtney. I was like, Hey, and she was like, how's your day? I was like, my head's just hurting. I'm going to go to sleep. And I literally went to sleep and I took uh, two Aleve or two Advil to subside the headache and went to sleep next morning. That's when everything changed. It was really difficult for me to wake up the next morning um my my sister and my mom were coming in to check on me they're like Courtney we need you to get up but it, I thought I was awake but it was hard for me to get up mm -hmm. and um I actually think I was falling in and out of consciousness um but when I finally I finally woke up and then um my sister was like hey Courtney come in and eat and I was like okay and my movements were slow and then all of a sudden I couldn't my mobility was really like I couldn't move and all of a sudden, I just remember like falling over and slumping over and not being able to stand. And all of a sudden, um, I couldn't move my arm. Like I was trying to eat and um, I couldn't move this part of my arm. Then my, my sister called my grandmother and my aunt and told them something's wrong. I couldn't move. And they told me they told her to keep me moving. So we got up and was trying to just walk the floor. And all of a sudden, I had violent shakes on the whole left side of my body and could not walk. I was falling over. Uh, my grandmother and my sister, came, uh, my grandmother and my aunt came over. They said I had to go to the ER. I didn't want to go to the ER, but something was clearly wrong. I got, I got rushed to the ER. Um, the, they um, immediately didn't ask questions. They just rushed me in. Um, and it was just very odd. They put these EKGs on me, but they, it was not uh, properly meaning like you're supposed to cover the person when you're putting those things on them, IV. And then uh, they started doing the CAT scan, MRI scan. And when the results came back, everything was normal. And so then at this point, they're like, well, nothing's wrong with you. So why can't you walk? And from there, they automatically assumed, like the doctors assumed, because I am African-American, maybe I was drugged or maybe, you know, because I'm a student, I'm stressed out at school or something like that. And so from there, from there on out, um, it was just a really, really bad experience and just the fact for my family to see me have to go through that was very heartbreaking mm -hmm. um I did get two different and, um it took me a while to get into PT OT and speech I finally got in but no one really knew much about uh brain injuries so mm -hmm. From there, well, I'm, it was, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to stop you there because we, we are going to get really, really more deeply into the, the process of accessing care and support. So but hold that thought. We're going to come back to it in a minute. 
I'm going to bounce over to the lovely Erica Renee Walker. Tell us a little bit about your experience, Erica. Can you read? Yes, we can. Okay. So uh, my injury is totally different. So I was um, actually, it was a weekend of events. I was shot in my head on June 1st. So my um, my brain injury is slightly different. I didn't have a concussion per se, um, but I know, so my, um, my well, I had a birthday that Friday. I was just turned 21. And so um, I was in celebration mode still. And so that Sunday I had um, went to a gas station and I bought something to drink. And um, I, I remember feeling weird, like something, like, well, something was going to happen, like something wasn't right. And so, um, and then I ended up uh, hearing a noise, like a loud bang or whatever, like maybe like a gunshot or something. And so not even knowing what it was. And I was told I ducked, but I don't remember ducking. And so I had blacked out and I was obviously, um, Rushed to the hospital because I, I had been shot, I guess. So I rushed to the hospital and I was sort of had seizures and stroke and all those things along the way. And I was putting it in an induced, medically induced coma and um, medically induced coma, but I didn't, they, I had a 5% chance of living. So I didn't, I wasn't even aware of anything that happened. Um, so it was all just like a blur. But when I, um, when I finally, after I had, I had two brain surgeries, after my second one, I started up showing brain activity. And come back around, I guess you could say. And then um, I still was not the clear though, but it was a little bit more normal. And so um, I think at that time I was transferred to another hospital called St. Mary's Hospital, and then I was receiving therapy. But I didn't I had no idea what was going on. And so it was explained to me that Erica, you had, you, had, um, you were shot in your head, brain injury. I didn't hear anything about that until um, like four months later. And so. Um, I was, just, I was just receiving therapy and I was also cooperative with the therapist because I didn't know what they were doing. I didn't understand. And so it wasn't explained to me what happened at all. And so um, I was just in the dark, basically. So wow. that's my experience. Wow. Wow. I'd like us to um, explore a little bit now what it was like trying to access medical care, right? What, what obstacles, what challenges did you encounter um, as you try to access care, and why do you think the, the experience that you had was the experience that you had? So let's start back with Deneen. Um, in terms of accessing care, I felt like care wasn't there for me at all. Um, I, I, every time I, I, I'd have these vertigo episodes where I would collapse and fall, or um, my very first episode, I remember um, my dog at the time who was alive came upstairs with me and normally doesn't sleep in the room with me. But um, that day, Sasha, for whatever reason, came with me. And I remember waking up in the middle of the night to stand and go to the bathroom and I fell and I was I was growing up and, and my sister's a very heavy sleeper and my dog, Sasha, she saved my life. She barked and barked and barked until my sister got there. Um, and an ambulance came and took me to the hospital. Um, but when I got there, they, they put me in, and I hear this common theme, they put me to the side. I was throwing up nonstop. I couldn't walk. Um, it was obvious that it was a that it was pressing that I get help, and nobody helped me. I was just in the hallway, up the bag, and a nurse every once in a while would prop the bag to my face, and um, I remember just feeling like I was alone. You know what? No one cared. Wow. And my sister was in the hospital. She was running and trying to get doctors to help me, and nobody would help. Wow. And I'm, I'm lost in the emotion of that feeling I and forgot the question right now. But um, in terms of accessing care, it took me fighting and um, continuing to self-advocate to say something's wrong. Why, I, why am I now getting another bill for that I can't pay for, for an ambulance and I'm taking 
taken from work and I didn't want my students to see me that day. I'll never forget the day I collapsed, I couldn't walk. And um, every time with, with even not being able to walk, I was never sent to physical therapy. Uh, my doctor, um, when I went for follow-up, gave me some exercises. It was never suggested, even though I talked about not being able to see and my vision was blurred and I couldn't read anymore and I had pro problems with processing cognitively, all of that. It was never suggested that I saw an occupational therapist until I finally met a person who was a nurse who saw me in the hallway one time when I was looking for a vertigo episode and she was black and she understood, she understood brain injury because she had a family member who had brain injury. And she stayed with me and, to, and really fought for me to get into a room so I could have privacy. And I remember just having this bag of vomit that she took care of me, she wiped my mouth. She listened to me. She asked me questions. She held my hand. She was present for me. And that didn't happen with anyone else. Wow. I, I just, before we move on, I, I just want to say to all of you that I'm so profoundly grateful for the courage that you have in showing up here and reliving your trauma, right? But I understand that you're doing this because you see the bigger picture. You see that what you're doing will impact and shift the way the experiences for other black women. So thank you so very much. Really, really profoundly appreciate it. Devine, what was your experience trying to access care? And why do you think that experience happened? Kind of along the same lines as Deneen. Um, lack of care. Um, running into so many stumbling blocks, advocating for my own self if it weren't for my family. I don't know where, where I would be. I was at the point where I couldn't even work, even still. I had a seizure on my job. I'm being rushed out and that is so embarrassing. I fell out in, in, in the file room at my job and people were on lunch. So I was in there by myself and they came back and they they had to call 911 and I'm being rushed out. And I'm like, my eyes, I'm like, I came to and I'm seeing myself being rushed out. And I'm like, oh my God, I had another one. And they really expected me to come back to that job. I was like, oh, there's no way. Cause that's so embarrassing. And then it's funny because I got over to the hospital. Um, I'm not going to mention the name of the hospital, but one of the doctors, he was like, you even scared me. You have three more once you got here. And that was like a joke to him. And then I'm like, okay, but here I am fighting for that. That right there should be in your notes. Why have I been denied? Not once, not twice, not three times, probably about five times now for disability. I literally right now have zero income coming into my home. Why, why, why? Where you would give, and um, I'm tired at this point, so I'm gonna say what I have to say. Some yeah. drugs, or or they can just say, oh, I have a back problem. You, you stop it. Here I have documented proof, and it's over, this is 17 years now, because of something that I did not do. Literally, you have a doctor that sat for himself. He saw me having these seizures. I have traumatic brain injury. I, I literally have loss of my memory, short term and long term. I don't remember my kids growing up. Severe depression, as a matter of fact, I didn't even know if I was gonna make it on here today because this depression is coming back. Mm. I mean, I'm like, my eyes are swollen because I've been crying. I was like, I'm, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna show up. I have to, because this is something that I live with every single day. But yeah, I can't get help. I'm still going through. I had to fight to even get the right neurologist who would adjust and put me on the right medication or I would still be having these seizures. And sometimes Abby still have breakthrough seizures. And I only got over to this place because she's one of the best neurologists here. And thank God she had compassion. I can remember one day even blowing up on her. And she was like, Davi, you have to fight through this. If it wasn't for her actually sticking with me, Ain't no time. I mean, I had a seizure behind the wheel twice. No, I have to take that back more than twice because God spared me. I remember times just pulling into a, into a parking space with my kids and, and having seizures. Nobody but God. And then it's just like, people, do, do you guys think I'm making this up? Do you think I want to be like this? 
a whole burden has been put on my parents because they had to pick up the slack. And this is not my fault. And it just, this whole thing makes me feel worthless, even still to this day. And I don't think nobody knows. My lovely, lovely sister, I am so proud of you. I am so profoundly grateful. I am so proud of the courage that you show and your voice is so impactful. So don't apologize, say what you gotta say. And I'm at the stage where I actually do name names because sometimes that's what, that's what it, it requires. So, but thank you so much for that. Yeah. Love you, sending you love. Thank you. Courtney, same question. What was your experience trying to access care? Um, gosh, that was a journey within itself. Um, like I kind of previ previously mentioned before, um, my experience in the hospital, I had two opinions. Um, one doctor was saying, no, she has, a con she has a concussion. She has a TBI. They said it was a mild TBI but they said she has a mild TBI and she, and this is beyond me. I, she needs to go, she needs to be transferred. She needs to be transferred. I won't mention the hospitals, but she needs to be transferred to this particular hospital um, to see this specialist who specializes in what she's going through. Another person said, oh, you know, they, they said it was conversion disorder. And as if I'm like making it up or because it's stress induced. And they were like, oh, she'll be, oh, she's an athlete. You know, she'll be better in six weeks. So they put me in outpatient therapy and even three months to get into the therapy therapy place because on my diagnosis from what I now know, they didn't even mark down, well, they marked down concussion, mild TBI, but they did not write whatever, they didn't like actually diagnose it, like saying this is what it is because it was, um, you know, two, di two different opinions. And so even, even then I had a um, primary doctor, horrible, 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 but he did not specialize in what I went through. So um, he, he, a lot of the people did not even refer me to where I needed to go or what I needed to do next. So we had to get a, also a patient advocate involved from the hospital because of my horrible experience there, just for me to be, for me to be able to get into therapy. And that was three months later. I can't move. I have tremors. I have memory issues, headaches, all, the whole list of, of that's under concussions. That's what I had. I had all of the symptoms and still not seen. And, and again, um, I know like Devine talked about having someone in your corner. My aunt was that person for me. She pushed for my therapy. She made sure these people were on top of their stuff to still keep seeing me because it was we had so much more to go. I was in OT. I was in speech therapy. I was in occupa uh, occupational therapy, physical therapy um, to get everything back and working. And my goal, I wanted to be back to where I was, like my athletic, you know, status. I didn't just want to walk. I wanted to run. I wanted to dance again. I wanted to do my athletics, athletics again. And again, my one of my doctors still would not refer me. And so he was like, well, you have to be the squeaking wheel. You have to keep and we would call, still denied. Um, also trying to get the proper, uh, like also get assistance. I'm a student, no insurance, still denied because they, I guess they didn't consider concussions or TBIs as a disability. I'm not really sure, but I, I went three times, got denied every time. Um, also to my therapist, they also tried to end my physical therapy because after three years, I finally got to walking a little bit but it wasn't to where I was and that wasn't good enough. And they were like, well, you're plateauing. I'm like, no, I'm not plateauing. Like, this is my goal and we're, we haven't even reached it yet. So I would push, you know, keep doing my best. Um, but if my aunt, again, she's also in the medical field too. She actually um, got in, got me in with a doctor um, and she, uh, my doctor, Dr. Colbert Threats. I will always remember her name because she was the first person that actually was like attentive and listening and watching. She's like, no, this is what you have. And I'm going, I'm going to transfer you to my colleague who is Dr. Perlmutter. And he's the movement disorder specialist who my first doctor was trying to refer me to and transfer me to in the beginning. And even that took, I guess, um, a couple more years for me to be able to see him because he's a specialist. But once I saw him, 
it was like a weight was lifted off my shoulder. He was listening to me. He was watching my my movements and he was he said, OK, tell me again how this happened. And he said, OK, I'm reading your chart. He said, you're telling me everything I need to hear. You, the patient, you are telling me what I need to hear. And I believe you. And he's like, I'm just going to let you know we're we don't know enough about the brain, but we're still learning more every day. He said, I promise you, we're going to get through this together. And when he said wow. that, I cried Wow! because like the first time someone actually believed me, like they weren't saying, they weren't saying, oh yeah, you have a concussion, but they're really thinking something else and writing something else in the script, which mm. was preventing me from having my care. And again, like I said, the people around you that are advocating for you when you can't advocate for yourself, which was my aunt and shout out to her. I know she's probably watching and I love you so much. Um, if it wasn't- What's, that, what's, you know, what's her name? Auntie who? <laughs> yeah. Her name is Del Steptoe Clark. And we love her. Uh, man, I can't wait for her to be, and she's going to be an amazing doctor. I promise you, she's going to be amazing. And we I love you so here. much. Thank you. I know you're watching. We are here for her. We <laughs> love her too. We absolutely love her too. Thank you, Courtney. <laughs> Erica, what about you, lovely? Access in care. You're on mute. Sorry. I, sorry. So for me, um, again, I was when I was shot, I didn't know when it happened. I didn't know anything was going on. Um, so I got to my third hospital. And so I'm just oblivious as to what's going on. Um, I was in a coma for a month and a half. And then when I woke up, like, I just, I, I just was there. I, I wasn't like, I was just there physically. I didn't know, like, I know people were messing with me, like, um, but they were trying to get me better and, you know, exercise my legs, things like that. But I, I didn't know, I had no idea. And so, cause I, I couldn't talk for about four months. So I'm just in my mind, just looking around, not really thinking much on it, not thinking much at all and just laying there and just existing. I mean, I didn't know they didn't take me to therapy or whatever, but nothing was explained. Like, if you had a brain injury, you know, nothing was said. Like, it was just like, do these exercises and, you know, just mm -hmm. do it, basically. So it was explained to me that you got an injury, so you need to exercise and, you know, need to transition to get better and do things like that. You don't, it was nothing was said to me. Like, I had a brain injury, thing like that. And so, access and care for me was immediate at first, because obviously I was shot and I almost died. So they had no choice but to um, service me. But when I got home, um, things shifted a little bit. But my cousin, she advocated for me when I was in the hospital. Um, so uh, she was a big, she was a big, uh, I call her the, bull, the bulldog of the family. She's a bulldog because she wanted to advocate for us. And so um, when I got home, things shifted. And I had, um, I think I had Medicaid at the time, I believe. And I was trying to get Medicare and Social Security and all that other kind of stuff. And that was kind of, that was kind of a struggle to get. But um that was kind of my experience with um, the hospital services, things like that. Wow, wow. Uh, I'm, I think we should really explore this thing about bulldogs and personal supports mm -hmm. and advocates, right? And again, we love them. We absolutely love them because they're lifesavers. Yes. So can you tell us a little bit about what uh, personal supports you were able to tap into, right, and, and rely on? This time I'm going to go backwards and actually go back to Erica. Okay. Tell us a little more about your bulldog aunt and others. My cousin. Um, oh, sorry, your cousin. She was amazing. Like, when I said she took notes, like, she's the note taker. Everything, she wrote everything down, like, everything. Like, when I woke up, when I did certain things, like, everything was in the notebooks, like, so it was, she was very, um, very good advocate for me. And um, I want to say other people, I, I, I think my mother, um, my aunt as well, um, what I remember, but she was my, my cousin Monique, she was definitely um the bulldog and definitely the um spokesperson because she's a lawyer. So she knows a lot about different things like that. So she knows a lot of stuff. And my, my, my family's never been through anything like this. I'm not the only person in my family that's ever been like injured in this to this capacity. Mm -hmm. So it was I all of us are new navigating this. So it's all like a it's all like all like fish out of water. And I'm not I might even know what's going on exactly. So I'm just like out of loop kind of, but just I'm just the one that's receiving the receiving like treatment or whatever so of course I had therapy you know stuff like that for a few months while I was at the hospital you know rehabilitation centers or whatever once I got home it was just totally different I think I may have had in-home services maybe like once maybe but that was it was a bit very long it was like a couple weeks so people don't see you progressing that much it's like oh you're, you're not going to progress so what it doesn't matter 
it where you get here or not. It's just like kind of like tossed up, like oh, it's, you know, it's just it's absolute, it's obsolete. So you're not gonna it's not gonna make a difference. And anyway, so I wasn't even the first chance to uh, progress. I feel like I wish I would have had like ongoing services. You know, I probably made a bigger um, recovery process. But you know, with um, Medicaid and you know, insurances, insurances is not really is not really um, the most effective. So. So you get in, you gotta get out. So if you're not improving with the, to their standards, you gotta go. You gotta get out of here. So it's like it's not you know we're not getting a fair opportunity to even like progress. I feel like so. You've been very polite by the way <laughs> you framed it, because I have a few choice words um, about <laughs> your, your insurance system in across the water mm -hmm. because in Canada it's quite different. Uh, Corny, tell us a little bit more about your spectacular aunt and the other members of your family, because the way you described it, your grandmother, your mum, your sister, tell us about the, the supports and how, how they actually helped you. Well, for sure. I'm going to start with my aunt, my amazing auntie. Um, oh my gosh. Like coming, like, it's almost like she came out the gate swinging. I just remember she came with her clipboard, her, Thing and everything that the doctor did, she took the notes. And because she knows medical terminology and just whatever they talk about, I had no idea. I had no comprehension, kind of like what Erica was saying. Well, it's like, why? I'm just thinking, like, why can't I move? I just want to get up and walk out the door. I don't want to be here. But, you know, she was questioning them, like, saying, hey, well, it wasn't a challenge, but she was like, well, thought about this. Have you thought about this? And a lot of times, she was right there by my side, along with my grandmother in the hospital. Um, but when the doctors would like kind of shoo everyone out, he, they would let my aunt stay. And so she would have to explain to me what was going on. And I, again, I had no idea what, what she was talking about because I've never been through anything like this. Plus my brain, it was just like, everything was so confusing. And, um, but she went through, like she took it in my therapy sessions. She even pushed when they tried to end my uh, therapy within three years. In 2017, they, they were trying to end it. And she was like, no, she has a lot. Courtney, you have to keep pushing. And it was kind of like her and my grandmother, because I lived with my grandmother because she had access to a lot of the handicap, uh, you know, it was more handicap accessible. Um, she would always have me, all, both of them would always have me do at home. And it was so painful to do. And I didn't like it. I would be crying half the time. I didn't want to wake up. Like, but they would always say, Courtney, you have to do this. Like, we, we have to keep going. And even though it was hard for me. Um, and they, I don't think they really liked being that, you know, person like, no, Courtney, get up. We're going to do this. Because they knew how much of a struggle it was. Um, so, um, but my sister, uh, my, all my cousins that came, they, they and my mom, they would all take me out of my element when I was, I went from a wheelchair weighted vest and then walking again. But when I was just in a wheelchair and couldn't walk and uh, they would take me in the wheelchair and just take me to go eat ice cream or a park. And that was like wonderful. Cause I didn't have to think about what I was going through. I just got a chance to have fun and be myself again and laugh, you know, even though things were kind of off kilter for me uh, with my journey of TBI that within itself um, of people praying for me, of, of people and my, my friends and family coming to visit me, it always made my day because I was really sad and um, I couldn't do what I could do before, but they didn't look at me any different. They would just encourage me. So beautiful. all of that would help. Absolutely spectacular. Absolutely beautiful. Devine, Devine. how you doing? Um, I don't know. To start with my parents or my kids, um, my kids were in the house and I became a, a, a totally different individual. So it's like they, especially my oldest daughter, it's like she became the mother because I had the severe depression. It was times when I literally couldn't get out of bed for days and they would come in and check, mom, you okay? No, you don't, don't worry about it. Um, we'll, we'll take care of the twins because then I have little ones. Um, we'll take care of them. Um, and they would just bring, you want to eat? You got to eat, mom. They would bring medication to me. And like I said, I had the seizures. They're the one getting me up and they're bringing me, nope, you're going to take this medication. Nope, you got to get up. You got to at least get up, mom. They would come and pray with me, pray over me. Um, 
they were just kicking it. Even now, it's my my oldest daughter that's paying my cell phone bill. They're helping me take care of everything. I and then as far as my parents goes, I haven't been able to work. So it's my parents who moved us into not an apartment but a house, and they've been paying a mortgage. Their mortgage is paid. Now here they've picked up another another mortgage, and I can remember being institutionalized. I had to go to a mental institute for three times for breakdowns. And I would look up, you got a visitor, Miss Manson. And every time I walk out, I'm sorry, guys, I'm being so emotional today. Brilliant. Every time I walk out the room, it's my father. I'm my father's only child. And he would just sit there. My father's not like one of those would be like, I love you. But just him sitting there. And I see him. These people stood by me. And it's like, it makes me feel even more awful because it's funny. When my mom saw my children's father who did this, she was like, uh-uh, no. And the more she said no, I said yes. So it bothers me because I often think if I only had to listen. And so many times because, of, you know, where my, my mind, I, I used to explode on my parents and I, I treated them awful, especially as you know, with the depression and me being sick or whatever. And never once, I'd be like, why do y'all do the stuff that, you know, like, and my mother's like, and, and I just keep telling them sorry, you know, because I'm a mom now and I see how it is. And, and I'm just like, if I only had to listen. And she's like, Lynn, because I'm demeaning at me and so my family calls me Lynn. You know, why do you keep telling us sorry? Girl, we, we don't have to do this. We do this because we want to do this. Girl, don't you know we love you? And it's just like, that makes me feel even more miserable. <laughs> <laughs> but I know that they love me and they've been my greatest support system. They used to come to my doctor's appointments, both my parents, you know, and she would call if she couldn't get in touch with me. She's calling my kids. How's your mother over there doing? Did she take her medication? Yeah. Make sure she eats, you know, things like that. And I'm just like, without them, they came out of retirement for us. Mm. Without them, I have no idea where I would be. None. I love them. I love that. And again, I completely understand why they tell you stop apologizing. It's not your fault. It isn't your fault. Uh, we pick who we pick. The fact that they are assholes, and I can say that, is not, it's not our fault. But, you know, it's, it's love. It's love that moves them. And so accept it. Bask in it. Glory in it. Because you are worthy. You deserve it. I've so got to make them happy and proud before they leave this earth. Well, they, I think they are. I think they are. Look at what you're doing here. Look at what your voice is doing. It's changing worlds. It's changing lives. So keep doing it. Much love. Thank you. Over to Deneen. Ms. Brooks. Yes. What's the to oh, have? Um, I, ha I have a number of angels that have been around me. My first being my sister who knocked down doors and walked behind stations where nurses were to with her cell phone calling my doctor to get help for me and um breaking down assumptions of no this is not a black woman who's on drugs who's having an overdose or anxiety um this is a woman that needs help and care um some of my angels were my students they would see me in the hallway um, I work for college and they were, they are now the professional taking care of me. Right. So those nurses and, um, TAs and nurse practitioners would see me and they'd say, professor, you're here. And they made sure I got into a room to get care. They made sure that someone listened to me, but it was amazing to hear one word professor. And then the other nurses that were on the floor would turn to say she's somebody. So I was nobody until somebody recognized me and that's not okay. That's not okay. That's not okay. We are all humans. We should all be getting care and we should all be treated human and with kindness and respect and listened to and heard and ask the questions to find out why we're there. That's beautiful. Well, let's, let's, as we're coming to sort of our, our conversation, I'd like to do like a, a lightning round, right? A minute each of what's your call to action? 
What do you want medical professionals to hear, know, understand, so that they're, the way they treat other Black women, Black people that show up in, in, in their care get a better treatment than you, than you did? Uh, let's start, this time, start with Courtney. So call to action. Oh my goodness, wow. There's a lot, but I'm going to say these points because this was my experience. Um, just because someone is African-American, whatever is on the chart of the, I'll say, what is it called? Um, I'm sorry, guys, I'm having a brain lapse. Um, I guess like if there's a list of like look, what to look out for in African-American people, it, okay, that sometimes that may be true, but really li like listen to your patients and what they're telling you. Like my doctor said, you're telling me everything I need to know. And that's how I was finally treated after, you know, five years, three years, you know, and getting the proper care, having a good bedside manner. It, you should treat people like they're human beings and not test subjects. Um, also to, um, Give, like giving them referrals of what they need of what they need because we don't know we're coming to medical professionals to get the help that we need so that we can be cured and also to medicine yeah some things you know we do need medicine for but like my doctor you know was trying to put me on a certain medication but he didn't want to because it was going to affect the functions even though it would mask the tremors on the left side of my body when I couldn't walk. So, you know, having good judgment, listen, you know, really being in tune with your patients, that's really, really important. And, you know, really having, you know, setting some goals for them to actually, you know, get better, not just masking the pain. Beautiful. Absolutely profound. Uh, Erica, call to action. What do you want health professionals to know? Um, I like protect the health care professionals and practitioners to know to um, explain the severity of what's going on. When a, when a patient is able to cognitively understand their what's going on, explain it to them. Like I said, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't get explained to me what was all going on. I just, I just see treat. I just was like getting services. I'm like, I didn't know why they were messing with me, trying to speak or give me um, all these things like that. I didn't know why they were doing it. So I think it's ex explaining why you're doing um, the exercises or whatever, explaining it to not only the patient, but their families as well. Well, I'm pretty sure they probably talk to my family about it, but explain to me, the person, like what's going on, because I can understand certain things. And just because I'm talking to somebody, I don't understand what's going on. So just give me the benefit of that, I guess, and explain, you know, my treatments. And so what's going on, not just leave me in the dark, like, you know, because I, I couldn't talk so, like, I have to have like a um, ABC board, I guess you can call it. Um, so just explaining things like that, just explain things, what's going on. Right, beautiful. Sounds like common sense, right? Yeah. Apparently it isn't common. Uh, Deneen? So I'm a professional. Um, we are more than just the paperwork that's there that says um, the diagnosis. So for me, it started with balance, tracking, vestibular, memory. The assumption was she was on drugs or drinking or had something there. Um, what, what else is there? And I heard that from some of the other stories here today. Um, so let's break through assumptions and look at our own biases, develop cultural competencies so that we can learn about the person and really listen to their stories so that we can get the the correct information to get them the correct diagnosis and access care for help and treatment for everyone so that we don't miss out on uh, um, potential research opportunities and potential healthcare opportunities that impact our personal, social, um, medical development in terms of all of our healthcare. We are social beings and we have faith-based practices. Love that. Love that. And what about you, Devine? What's your call to action? 
You're on mute, lovely. First and foremost, I would like all of the medical professionals, professionals from our doctors, PAs, nurses, I don't care what it is that you do, remember that you signed up to be in that position. So, and you're getting paid for such, remember that. Um, I didn't put you in that position. You put yourself in that position. Um, so treat it as such. When you was going to school for it, you knew what it required. So um, I know it's stressful, but e being a patient is even more stressful for all of us. So each case, next thing I would like you to remember, each case is different. So please treat it as such and treat us as you would want to be treated. Or if your daughter was in there or your mother or your brother, your sister, whatever, treat us as you would want to be treated. And remember, there's resources out there that you know of. Why aren't you sharing them with us? A call to action. I shouldn't have to be ringing the call button three, four, five times because it's a group of nurses sitting in there chatting. And you, oh, wait, I, I'll go in there a minute. Come to me now. Treat me the way that you want to be treated, period. And just because I have a skin color that you may not necessarily like, once again, remember, you signed up for this, not me, period. 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 I just want to end uh, before I sort of wrap, wrap, wrap it up. But again, taking off of what Devin said, how much role do you think the color of your skin had to play in your experience? Uh, let's start with Courtney. Um, I believe mine was a twofold because I was young and a student, they automatically assumed I was stressed, like it was stress that was causing it on, on me, for me to not be moving, even though I told them I hit my head. Um, also too, most definitely uh, me being African-American, the hospital that um, I went to is, you know, the area around us is now predominantly African-American. So I'm sure that medical professionals at that hospital have seen a lot and people they do you know some people do you know lie so they could get the medic you know medic like said, said every person that is not the same as the other and um the way how i was treated in that hospital i will never forget that because it was the most horrific experience i will ever i, I wouldn't want to see a family member ever go through that or anyone go through that like i had experience with that just the automatic, like, oh, she's black. So all of these things that, you know, come with, you know, whatever racial biasness, biases or whatever, come with her because I'm looking at her as a young African-American student. Well, so that that's a lot. That is a lot. Erica, how much do you think your race had to do with this? I would say 50%. Um, because there was one particular time when I was at a hospital or a rehab center um, where I was only, only African-American on the floor. Like, on, not only that, but only African-American women. It was like all males. So they were all Caucasian males. And so I'm the only um, African-American on the floor. And um, I just think that certain times, you know, where, where it may be a look or a different, um, I don't know if I want to call it, well, like a look or something like that, or like, it just like, a little smart or more something like that. I feel like it was just like, I felt like I was kind of prejudged, I guess, because uh, um, that accident didn't happen. So maybe like, maybe her fault per se, but it was not my fault. I was just an innocent bystander. But I think just a, a little bit prejudged, I would say 50-50 overall. Yeah, well, that's, that's impactful. Devine? How much did your skin color have to do with the way you, do you think it had to do with the, the way you were treated? I would have to say a lot. Um, not only me being a black African American woman, but to have gone through and stayed with someone who actually abused me. Oh yeah. And then a single mother, not married. Once they find all of that out, uh, I'm getting that, you know, and then I can't, I got passed over a lot and I didn't get, treated the way that I know I, I should have and could have been treated. And I now I'm finding out about a lot of resources that I should have been, um, that I'm entitled to. And now it's like I'm past the age of 
a lot, a lot. Mm -hmm. Wow. What about you, Devine? Denine or Devine? Devine. Denine. 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 I'm so sorry, Denine. I love me some Devine, though. <laughs> me too. I love you too. Me too. <laughs> and that necklace. That necklace is rocking it. But yeah, go to Denine. Go for I, it. I will say um, wholeheartedly that my skin color and being a woman and being a woman who um, had knowledge um, of the system played into my experience. They didn't like that I was educated. They didn't like that I asked questions. So I was put into an area where I couldn't ask questions. A call button would be removed. Um, they didn't like that I had an advocate with me. Um, and they definitely, um, I was re not put in positions where I could get access to care and treatment for um, my brain injury until it was effectively diagnosed by someone who was of Asian descent and connected me with resources like PT and OT and also supported me in saying, you can do this. Let me hear what, what it's like, what your experience is like now. And she asked finally the correct questions and gave me hope. So throughout the process, until I met this, um, my concussion doctor, I didn't have hope. And my concussion doctor, my gynecologist um, were the only two people that really talked about relationships. And what was it like to actually stand up and brush my teeth was, they asked questions that were not on paper. Mm -hmm. What is it truly like to function and get up and what's a day like for you? What does it feel like? What does it look like? Describe it to me. So with those deep questions, it, it gave me a connection for physical therapy so that they were able to incorporate movement, dance, art, and faith into my holistic care of treatment and planning. So I'm thankful for, I'm gonna say Dr. Ward, I'm thankful for Dr. Beth Howe, who are amazing women. I love that. Well, we're wrapping up and I cannot tell you how much I love you women. I cannot tell you how amazed I am at your tenacity and your courage. I cannot tell you how angry I am at how the medical profession that is meant to help and support actually turned its back because of the, the skin that you live in. I cannot tell you how disappointed I am at your medical system, right? That people are fighting for insurance that will help save lives. I am beside myself with rage at how these individuals who went through formal education, right? Purportedly to help and to support then judged you because of the skin that you, you walk in. I believe in naming names and I love the fact that you all were very gracious and only named names of individuals who were actually very, very supportive. But I actually think sometimes accountability looks like naming the names of individuals, calling them up, calling them in, individuals who didn't do what they were supposed to do because those individuals need to be held accountable. But the work that you've done, the conversations that we're having, the work that you continue to do around advocacy for individuals with traumatic brain injury is truly inspirational. I want to thank all of you for showing up today. I want to thank all of you for standing in your truth, dealing with the trauma, holding it, holding it firm, but still speaking truth, because this is such an important conversation that will, I know, profoundly impact the lives of other people. I want to thank you all. Denine Thank Brooks. you. I just want to go back to the chat. And in the chat, uh, it sounds like this group of women are powerful. And we have someone in the room who says that they will make these suggestions and they thank us for our words and just grateful for our voices. So I just wanted to share what's in the chat. So that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Together we are strong. Yes, we are. So Denine Brooks, Devine Mason, Courtney Walker, Erica Renee Walker, thank you, my sisters. Stay strong and we're here. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you.